So thank you. I receive that word for myself. Today, I want to talk about something that no one's just going to be really, really excited about. Hallelujah! Hey, amen. It's not the kind of word, by the way, somebody's really cute putting this thing of Gatorade down here that's really... If you've been following me on Facebook, you'll know what that's about. That's really, really, really funny. I've been doing these, you might be a preacher ifs on Facebook. And if they're coming straight out of a book. I'm not coming up with these, but I find one, and I think it's humorous. And I wrote one this week. You might be a preacher if you secretly wish the worship team would drench you with Gatorade after a good sermon. So this morning, we have a bucket that someone has placed here. Thank you. That made my day. That's awesome. <laughs> so I might go for a run as soon as this is over. But what I was saying is, it's not a word that we're just going to be really excited about. And it's not a word that is going to make us want to jump up and scream and run around the building. It's not that. But it's a word of the Lord this morning. And I feel like it's what God has for us. And it's straight out of his word. And this morning, I want to talk about the topic of judging. I heard a couple of moans. (laughs) Let me just ask a question, a little poll here. How many people feel like it is, as Christians, we're not supposed to judge? How many people would say, as Christians, we have an obligation to judge? Let me tell you something. You're both right. You're both right. But I feel like the church has missed this issue. We're going to go through the Bible on what Jesus says about judging and what the Apostle Paul says about judging. First thing I want to talk about is what is our motivation in biblical judging? Why do we judge? Well, we judge for multiple reasons. One, I mean, let's just be honest. It makes us feel better about ourselves when we judge what somebody else is doing, does it not? Let's be honest this morning, does it not? We get a little ego boost, do we not? What about this? We judge because it helps take our eyes off of our own sin, and it's a lot easier to look at somebody else's, is it not? Yeah, it is. What should be our motivation in judging? I'm going to say it's this, restoration and reconciliation. When we judge one another, if the occasion calls for it, it should be in love to restore and to reconcile. Amen? So we're just going to do a little Bible study this morning. You can open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is where we're going to start. And I'm sorry, I've been good about staying in the same location. We are going to be all over the place this morning. Let's just pray, can we? God, this morning, I know this is what you have for us today. So open our ears. Lord, I pray that you would silence Everything going on, Lord, around us and our minds, Lord, every situation we've brought into this place, help us to truly learn, Lord, what it is that you have for us to do. Restore the culture and community of believers that you set up to be the case, Lord, that we have really destroyed. Forgive us and cleanse us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, look at verse 28 says this, where should we start judging? Let a person examine himself. Then, and so eat of the body and the drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. We're talking about communion here, holy communion. But it's much deeper than that. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. Listen to this verse. If we have judged ourselves, truly we would not have been judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with 
the world. Let me tell you, the first step of judgment should start with yourself. Paul's talking to the church at Corinth. They are doing communion all wrong. He has to lay out the order of how they're going to partake in the Lord's Supper. And in the midst of this, there's people that's taking it in an unworthy manner. And he says, you ought to start by examining yourselves. And I want to suggest to you that not just in communion, but in every aspect of church life, as we examine, it must first begin with ourselves. Is that not the truth? We need to start with examining ourselves. But the problem is, we give a free pass to ourselves way too often. Don't we? I give a free pass to myself. We give ourselves a get out of jail free card. Like we get in trouble, we do something we know we're not supposed to do, and the things that we pass judgment on other people, we give ourselves a free pass, saying things like, well, that's just how I was raised. That's just how I am. You've got to look over me. That's just how I am. It's how my daddy was. It's how my granddaddy was. That's just who we are. Let me tell you something. That junk doesn't fly. It doesn't fly. You know why? Because there's supposed to be a change when we encounter Jesus. And when you encounter Jesus, you cannot go on continuing to live your life as if nothing happened. There's a song we used to sing in the Pentecostal church I grew up in. You won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. Bound, oppressed, tormented, sick or lame. The Holy Ghost of Acts is still the same. You won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. But we have built this culture in church that we expect to come into the presence of God and we expect to leave and do what we want to do when we want to do it without self-examination. Let me tell you something, friend. When you encounter Jesus, you will be changed. Or you will ignore the voice of the Holy Spirit because He is not okay with where you are. He's not. You might be okay with it, but guess what? He is not. Let's say that again. Examine yourselves this morning. And this is not a condemning word to you, but my heart this morning is that self-examination would start in all of us. I really want you to look within your heart at where you are and what you are excusing in your own life. Things have changed in church culture. And if you don't see something in your life, look a little harder. Look a little harder and more longingly into that mirror. You know why? Because I want to be like Him. Do you? Are you happy with the word that Cynthia said this morning, just playing the church game? Or do we want to look like Jesus? I'll let that soak in a minute. Are you happy with where you are? Are you? Are you happy with the stuff in your life that you know Jesus isn't happy with? There's been times I've excused it. Self-examination is the place where judging must start. I say this all the time, we read the word of the Lord, but it's time that we let the word of the Lord read us, where we are. That's not where judging is supposed to stop in the Bible. Turn a couple chapters over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Everyone say self-examination. Chapter 14, verse 29 says this. It gives another biblical reason to judge. 14, 29. Let two or three prophets speak and let others weigh what is being said. Weigh or judge what is being said. Now we are a church, praise God, that is a spirit-filled church that believes in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. And as long as I'm the pastor, that's exactly where we're going to walk because we believe in the fullness of the Spirit. But let me tell you something. Every prophetic utterance that you ever hear in this church, every sermon you ever hear in this church, you better sit there and weigh and judge. Is this really what God is saying? It 
it's dangerous. Let me tell you one of the most dangerous phrases you'll ever hear. Thus says the Lord. You know why it's dangerous? Because God's been blamed for a lot of stuff that's not his fault. <laughs> Has he not? It is dangerous, church. Well, you might sit there and think, well, I, don't, I, don't, I hate to judge. You better judge. Paul tells us we better weigh what's being said. Is it right? Is it from the Lord? And if not, we'll accept a lot of junk. Let me tell you, that word that Cynthia gave us this morning, that is a word from the Lord for our church. Now, what are you supposed to judge the content of what's being said? Is this a word from the Lord? You know what? If we go to the thing of judging, you know where our judgment goes to? The messenger, like you said. The messenger, not the message. How many people would just be honest enough to say, can we be honest in church or are we going to lie to God and everybody? You would be honest and say, there have been times I have rejected a word from the Lord. I have no clue what they said. I just don't like how they said it. We reject the messenger. You might be rejecting a word from the Lord. Do you think about during the days of John the Baptist? Would anybody question if he had a word from the Lord? What was his word? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was the one of the voice crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Praise God. What an awesome prophetic word. While he's dressed in camel hair eating honey and locust. If there was ever a messenger to be rejected. If John the Baptist got up this morning and gave a prophetic word. I would dare say a lot of us in the. If we didn't know who he was, who is this guy? What in the world is he saying? When it gets quiet, I know we're guilty. And we get the old lemony face like we've eaten a bag of lim I don't know about that. The messenger is not what we're supposed to be looking at in that. Obviously, the messenger is important. But what you're supposed to be judging is, is this a word from God? We know that there was a word given to a donkey. Stop! Well, you're just a donkey. I'm not going to hear this. He better hear it. It was a word from the Lord. Okay. Are we supposed to judge spiritual gifts? Huh? You don't think we're supposed to judge spiritual gifts? I heard a no. Go ahead. No, no, that's exactly right. We all have spiritual giftings. Absolutely. I'm not saying should we question or judge if they're real. No, absolutely. We all are a portion as God wills. But as we operate in the prophetic, as I operate in pastoral teaching, you better weigh and judge, is this a word from the Lord? Okay, that's what I'm saying this morning. So, judge prophecy according to the word of God. Start with self-examination. Here's the next thing we're supposed to judge. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. I told you this is not not an exciting sermon that's going to make you want to scream. But how many people think that this is actually what the Word of God is saying? Okay, good. That's, that's all I care about. You can get your entertainment from football today. It's week one. Praise God. You're getting your truth right now. You get your entertainment somewhere else. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. I'm getting hungry. Every tree that does not bear 
Good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. One more verse. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I told you we were going to turn a lot of places. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, judge the spirits, to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. That is the spirit of Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now in the world already. What's the third thing we're supposed to judge? False prophets. How will you know them? You will know them by their fruit. And John goes on to say, you will know them by testing if they will affirm the fact that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Now, you have to be careful. You know why? Because a lot of false prophets have found their home on Christian television. Is that true? Don't think you're safe just because it says those beautiful letters and has a cross in the corner. I'm sorry, that's not the Word of God. I've heard a bunch of junk on TV that I'm thinking, who put this person on TV? That's heresy. <laughs> Have you? Test the spirits. Judge. You know why? Because we are in an age where heresy is being preached in pulpits all across America. What are you standing on? You better know by being able to rightly divide the word of truth and to judge if someone's standing on that or not. Praise God. I love these sermons. Praise God. Judge false prophets and false religions. That's a good thing. You get a knock on the door from somebody trying to convert you. Just ask them if they believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. If they say no, you try to evangelize them. Go the other way. <laughs> Turn them into the mission field instead of the mission force. I mean, I'll just say it. I'm not going to say it. I mean, we're telling truth this morning. If someone is not standing on that fact, they are a cult. And it's heresy. Jesus Christ is God in human flesh. And He came and died for your sins. He was the Word, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the truth. And if we're not standing on that, then you are not a Christian. Is that true? Okay, good. All right. Now it's going to get fun because we're getting inside the church. Yay. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to land here a little bit. How do we do this? Because here's the culture that God set up in church. In Ephesians, don't turn there. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. But in Ephesians, Paul says, being mutually submitted one to another. Let me tell you, church, we need to return to the culture of accountability one with another. You know what culture has replaced that? Why don't you mind your own business? Let me tell you something. That is not from God. Minding your own business is not a thought that originated with God. He set it up where we're mutually accountable one to another. And we're submitted one to each other. But instead, we've replaced it like, hey, you worry about your own life. That's not how God set it up. The greatest strength in your life is the people sitting right around you. It's the greatest strength in my life. You know what? If I get in some type of heresy or junk, I expect you to come to me. Hey, Richie, you're, you're misstepping here, buddy. I love you enough. Now, don't come in with a baseball bat and beat my brains out, but in love, speak the truth in love. Say, hey, buddy, you're missing it here. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 says this, I wrote to you in my letter. Now, of course, we always say, don't judge. I'm not the judge. I'm not supposed to judge. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, 
not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. So let me stop there for a minute. He said, I'm telling you, don't associate with these kind of people. I'm not talking about the people outside that door because if that was the case, you would have to remove yourself from planet Earth, which is an impossibility. Well, there's one way to remove yourself from planet Earth. I don't recommend it. He said, don't do that. Don't do that because you would have to remove yourself. But now I'm writing to you not to associate anyone who bears the name of brother. Okay? If he is guilty of sexual immorality, now we can look at that and say, well, of course. But look at Paul's list here. Don't associate with anyone who bears the name brother if he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed. How many people would look at that and say, you know what, Richie? I've been greedy this week. See, there's a list of sins that we excuse that we think, oh, that's... That's not a bad one. That's okay. Greed's one of them. Gossip is another. It's okay. It's just part of culture. It's how, it's how we are. Paul says if that's who you are, then don't even associate with that person. Does he say that? An idolater? A reviler? A drunkard? A swindler? Not even to eat with such a person. Why not? For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Paul says, I'm not judging the outside. That's not what I'm called to do. Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? How many people would question, is this the Word of God? Is it the Word of God? Is it the New Covenant? We're not talking about Old Testament stuff. That This is New Testament. How many people believe this is what we're supposed to be doing? But you don't see it in practice. Why? Okay, sometimes you're afraid you're going to hurt that person. Anybody else? We're excusing ourselves. Okay, if I excuse you, then I don't want that person coming to me. Like, so it's really a problem in our own heart. We don't want accountability ourselves. We've lost something that God set up in the church as a strength in the church. And we've made it as something intrusive that it never was supposed to be. If I went to my brother here and said, listen, brother, I love you so much. You're a brother. And I want you to know, I see something. I don't, by the way, this is a good man of God. I see something there. And I love you enough to tell you. We're in fellowship with each other. And I'm telling you what the Word of God says. And I'm not elevating myself above you. I'm telling you, I am a sinner saved by grace. But I'm telling you, this is not right according to the Word of God. And I want to walk through this with you. Who would be offended at that? Somebody that loves you enough that, to tell you, hey, you're going down a road that's leading to destruction. God judges those outside. But purge this evil person from among you. I'm not supposed to judge. That's not what Paul says. Paul not only says you're supposed to judge, he commands us to. Is it not those inside the church that you are commanded to love enough to lovingly correct? Church, is this the word of God? This is the kind of culture that Jesus set up for us to live. But instead, we've become these displaced, isolated pockets of people walking by themselves through life, falling on our faces. When God said, stop it, I didn't set it up that way. But we don't want people in our face. You stay out of my business. I love you from afar. That's not 
the word of God. So Paul says we have an obligation and responsibility to judge those inside, not the outside, which I find to be extremely, what word do I want to use? Ironic. Thank you, Jenny. She's my walking dictionary thesaurus. She's a beautiful woman in so many different ways, and I'm a lucky person. Yes, thank you, Damien. Blessed. I'm blessed, yes. But there was a little streak of luck. I don't know how I caught her. Actually, she caught me. No, I'm kidding. It's ironic that most of the judging inside the church goes out those doors. Does it not? Man, we're good at judging everybody out there. And Paul says, stop it. That's God's job to judge those outside the church. You judge yourself. If we ever sit in that place as judge, and I know that you do, and I know that I do, how much of it is towards ourselves in love with the goal of restoration and reconciliation? Or how much of it is those filthy sinners are ruining our culture? I'm going to move on. How do you judge inside the church? That's what I want to spend the rest of our time on. I told you we're not going to get excited today, but it's still the Word of God. And if we could set this up, I'm telling you, it would be beautiful. Matthew chapter 7. I got a lollipop for the first person to get there. No, I don't. Ready? Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. Okay, that's what we quote now. Honestly, that verse is probably quoted more than John 3.16 nowadays. Everybody used to know John 3.16. Now they know, judge not or you're going to be judged. Number one, we know that one. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured unto you. First thing in judging inside the church in love is recognizing this. The measure you use, so shall it be measured unto you. That keeps a lot of people from obeying what Paul said to do. Because we don't want that. Because we don't go to people in love. So instead of judging, we don't go to that person like Jesus said do in Matthew chapter 18. You see your brother in fault, go to him between you and him. And if he repents, you've earned your brother. That's what Jesus says do. What we do is we see our brother in fault. I'll go to every other person besides that guy. Form us a posse and let's go take him out for the kingdom of God yeah that is dangerous friend because Jesus says with whatever measure you use so shall it be measured unto you you know what that means when you find yourself in fault you can expect the posse to come looking you up too with the measure you use recognize that's how you yourself will be judged So what does that mean for us in today's church? You better pour yourself in with the love of God. I'm not above criticism or anything. I want people to come to me, but I want them to come to me in love. With a loving heart, speaking the truth in love. I want that. So you know what I need to do to receive that? I need to give that. Recognize that. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log that is in your own eye? How did that person get a log in their eye in the first place? First thing is this. Recognize with the measure you use, it's going to be measured unto you. But the second thing, it goes back to self-examination. You must first deal with your own junk. And if we don't, we're in error. So even if I come to 
Brother Cliff here in love. And I haven't gone to the cross myself. Jesus, I realize I'm not worthy and I got a mess in my own life. And I want to look like you. Help me get the junk out of my life. And I see my brother, Lord, and I, I realize that, that I got a lot of problems myself. And I'm unworthy to even talk to him, Lord, so I, I want to be clean before you. You know, a lot of people stop right there, but with all due respect, Jesus didn't stop talking right there. Starts with self-examination. What does he go on to say, though? After you've removed the log from your own eye, then you can see more clearly to remove the splinter from your brother's eye. See, no one wants to go there. Oh, you're saying look at yourself, stay out of everybody else's business. That's it, God. That's lesson learned. Don't judge and deal with your own stuff. You're a wreck and a mess yourself. Stay out of everybody else's business. That's not what Jesus was saying. Recognize you're going you're gonna to get it back, whatever you do. So walk in love. Deal with your own stuff. Get the log out of your eye. And then you have an obligation and a responsibility one with another and an accountability with your brothers and sisters in Christ to remove that from them. You know what? There's nothing more frustrating than getting something in your eye. Is there? Gosh, how agitating that is. I get stuff in my eyes all the time. And I'm a baby. It can take one little speck of dirt or a bug, those stinking summer bugs that just won't leave you alone. You're out there mowing and you cut the grass and all of a sudden there's like 50 gazillion little bugs start flying everywhere. And they get in your eye, like, God, I can't see a thing. You know what? There's nothing wrong with admitting, I can't get this out. Jenny, come here, baby. I need this out of my eye. She comes and I squirm and I, I don't like for people to look that closely at the things that's going it's a little too close. Matter of fact, if, if your eye's open and somebody's coming at your eye with a finger, your natural reaction is going to be to close them tight. Stay away from my eye. That's very sensitive. The eye is a sensitive place. You don't want anybody to touch that. I think it's very interesting that Jesus used the analogy of the eye because it's such a sensitive thing. So it is in our own lives. I don't like people touching those things in my life. Richie, you got an attitude problem. Oh, oh, close my eyes. I don't look at that. But you know what? If we will open ourselves up in love as a body of Christ, man, we can look like him a lot more than we do right now. The problem is we don't want people to see that. It's too sensitive. It hurts too much. Self-examination. Realize the measure that you use. And then go on and remove the speck out of your brother's eye and love. You know, just let me stop for a minute. How many people, you would be honest and say, you know what? I've not been accountable, but I see the strength in what you're saying. I would like to be more accountable than I am right now. I know I would. Let me be honest, guys. That's the church that I want to live in. We need to be wrapped in each other's lives. I can't stand what I call hello friends. You know what they are? Hi. See them on Sunday. See you next week. Hey, how are you doing? That's the extent of our relationship. We just say hello. There are no hello friends in the body of Christ. We're supposed to be intricately involved in each other's lives. I don't want you living with me, but I want to be involved with your life. There needs to be a deeper level of intimacy in the body of Christ, guys. And if we would be honest with ourselves, there's people hurting in this building this morning that nobody knows. And you've been hurting a long time. A really long time. There's people in here that have been lonely a really long time. Some have been depressed for a really long time. And it's a speck in your eye. And it hurts to get close to. And if we would open ourselves up, and like Cynthia said, that was a word from the Lord, and remove those masks and become real with each other once again. 
man, we could have something that God created us to be. I'm going to be honest. That's the church I want to live in. That's the church family that I see here and I see the potential for it. But it's going to take a conscious choice of reality, of being genuine, one with each other. But we all have this little lockbox that we don't want people to get to. You can get to everything in my life. You can see this facade I've built. But you can't come here. <laughs> get rid of those. Don't you get tired of having to look over your back to see really who's watching? Don't you get sick of changing hats, putting on church hat, putting on work hat and there's times your crowds intermingle and you get all messed up and don't know what hat you're supposed to have on. <laughs> God just wants us to be real and authentic where we love each other. The other key is being humble. In James chapter 4, after we realize the measure that we use is going to be used unto us, after we self-examine and remove the logs from our own eye, after we go to the next step of obedience and we remove the speck in love and speak the truth in love, James says in chapter 4, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. Don't speak evil against your brother, for if you speak evil against your brother and judge your brother, then you speak evil against the law and judge the law. And if you speak evil against the law and judge the law, then you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. For there's only one lawgiver who's able to save and destroy. Who art thou to judge us another? What is he saying by that? Is he saying, don't ever judge? No, what we do is we, we become judge, jury, executioner. Judge in accordance to the word of the Lord. The law itself will be the judge. And what our goal is in, is in it is to humble ourselves. Be humble, one with each other. Nobody can receive correction in a prideful, haughty attitude. Crawl down off the platform you've built for yourself for a second, the pedestal, and be real and humble. And let the word of the Lord do the judging and you seek to restore and reconcile each other. Not to ostracize. To reconcile. And Paul had to do it a lot. To judge or not to judge. It depends. It really does. It's not an all the time judge. It's not an all the time not judge. But we have an obligation one to another. To judge according to what the Bible says judge. Prophecy. Yourself. And each other inside the church. And he gives the protocol to do it. In love. Through self-examination. Through using the appropriate measure. And doing it being humble. Guys, I love you. And I'm being honest. Why are you, why are you talking about this, Richie? Because this is important to me. This is the kind of church that I want to live in. That we're accountable. I don't want people slipping through the cracks. If somebody would have only known. No. Nope. Because we're all joining hands in this thing together and walking towards Jesus. And like Cynthia said, I don't want to play the church game. I want to look like Him. I want to smell like Jesus. I want His fragrance to be on me. And I realize I cannot get there by myself. And He doesn't expect for me to. He's given me you. He's given us each other to walk this journey together. Let's remove those masks and walk down this path together. Lord Jesus. Lord, I told them it's not going to be exciting. But you know what? It really is. It really is. Because we are accountable to each other, Lord. And right now, I want to thank you for giving me, the people in this room, the greatest strength in our lives is sitting right beside us and Lord I ask your forgiveness for the culture that we've developed of mind your own business 
the fences that we've built around our lives, Lord. To keep everyone else out, Lord. When there's really supposed to be an open door policy. Where we have access into each other's lives, Lord. And we are real and authentic one with another. Lord, that's the kind of church that I want Christian fellowship to be. A church filled with love. A church filled with restoration. A church filled with hope. A church filled with accountability. A church full of people who will stand up on that wall and be the watchmen for their brothers and for their sisters, Lord. Not in a haughty attitude, Lord, but in humbleness before you. So, Lord, today I call forth the watchmen. But we're going to start with something this morning, Lord, that I feel like needs to be done. Lord, we're going to start with that first step, and we'll go from there. Lord, it's time to do some self-examining today, Lord. Your word says if we would judge ourselves, then we wouldn't be judged. And oh, how many times, Lord, we should have done that in our lives, but we neglected to be real, even before you, to even deal with the own things in our own lives, Lord. So this morning, Lord, we self-examine, Lord. It's time to remove some planks. Lord, it's time to remove some planks out of our eyes, Lord, some logs, Lord, that have been lodged. Some are of sin, some are of attitude, some are of mindsets, Lord. So we self-examine this morning, Lord, and we see what's there. We don't want to look over it, Lord. Like looking in a mirror, just ignoring the things that we don't want to see. We want to see what you see, Lord. And we examine our own hearts today, Lord. Lord, and that's the attitude I've been in all week, Jesus. And to be honest, I haven't liked what I've seen, Lord. Lord, I've been guilty, Jesus, of criticism. I've been guilty of so much, Lord, of wrong attitudes, of wrong thinking. So I self-examine this morning, Lord. I've been guilty of not being disciplined, Lord. Of not giving you my best. Help us to be real, Lord. Help us to be real, Jesus. One with another, Lord. And help us to judge without being judgmental. Lord, help us to come along beside our brothers and our sisters today, Lord. This morning, as they lead the worship, these altars are open. And I don't like having what I call forced altar calls, but I want to provide you an opportunity this morning. There's some people that need to get some things right with God. And even just sitting here today, you feel the tug of the Holy Spirit that something's not right. You're tired of looking over your back to see if people are watching what you're doing. And you want to live that life without regret. And you got things that you've been ashamed that if people knew what was there. And this morning, you want those logs out of your own eye. You want them to be gone and just live a life of openness and authenticity in front of their brothers and sisters. And you know that there are things that does not look and smell like Jesus in your life. And you want them gone today. These altars are open. And as you come, brothers and sisters in the Lord are going to surround you. They're going to pray with you. They're going to love you. Because that's what we're called to do. To have a heart of restoration and love one with each other. So as Dale and the team leads us this morning, let's all stand to our feet. And if you know you need to get something right with Jesus, these altars are open today.